going to talk about the latest government initiative of uh, the Philippines. And uh, it is about Project NOAA. I've entitled it Science to Survive. And it's really a project that seeks to address all of our disaster problems. But I always like to put things into perspective. Yes, it's true that uh, our problems are huge. But as a scientist, I've learned from astronomy that we are just but a speck in this vast universe. And as a geologist, from these rocks, we learned that Earth's time is immense, about 4.6 billion years. And we only live here for probably about maximum of, uh, what was that talk, 70, 72 years. And in this vast space and time, we are actually all here gathered together breathing the same air, looking at each other, and just sharing and talking and discussing uh, TEDx Manila. What are the chances? What are the chances also that I would be wearing the same shirt as the first speaker? It's very small in this vast space and time, but still, we think that we have a big problem. It's for good reason. The reason is because we need to ensure our survival. We need to ensure that we exist, or at least our species exist in the future. So that disaster problem is huge, and we need all the hands and minds that we can get and use the best science and technology as possible. There is only one thing constant in this world, and it is change. And with all of these changes, many people and many species die, they live, and then they get non-existent, they get extinct. And all of these species got extinct probably because they did not have science. One benefit that we have is to use science to be able to ensure our existence into the future. And it makes me think that in this vast space and time, that our purpose really is to be a conduit between the past and the future. And we must do and contribute everything that we can however way we can or whatever way we can in order to build that bridge into the future. And our path is not that straightforward. Our path is very difficult because it's a dangerous crossroad. And with all of that, we must be able to gather all that we have learned. We must be able to use human intelligence and collect all the science that has been built throughout the decades in order to create a safe path into the future. Here is Ginza Ugon that's about 700 meters high. This landslide is uh, so huge, it's about four kilometers long, about two kilometers wide. And the size of the platform of this landslide footprint is about three-fourths the size of the University of the Philippines campus. It's so huge. And just to give you an idea, that helicopter is the scale for this landslide. And a town called Ginza Ugon was buried in this area. They were looking for school children, about 200 plus, who were texting, I think, on the fourth day or fifth day. And they were just looking for the uh, buried uh, elementary school. That's the backhoe that was used, uh, searching and trying to look for that elementary school. And in an aerial view, those backhoes actually are these backhoes, that one and this one. And this picture shows to you that floodplains are natural part of the river system. And during heavy rains, these floodplains get inundated. Places or areas that we claim as our own. And it is to no wonder that whenever there are heavy rains, all of these places that we've inhabited, inhabited actually get flooded and sometimes 
when there are people there, uh, we have disasters. In 2006, uh, there were lahars that cascaded down the slopes of Mayon Volcano. I believe it's the archetypal volcanic beauty. Uh, I, I'm a volcanologist and I've seen a lot of volcanoes and this is the most perfect cone or most perfect volcano in the world. And uh, a lot of lahars went down and cascaded into barangays in, in Padang, in uh, Ginubatan, in Kamalig, in uh, uh, Daraga. Roughly about 1,500 people died. And these lahars were not just ordinary floods. Uh, they carried big boulders and they swept along barangays and buried a lot of houses with big boulders, probably as big as trucks. These are the uh, boulders that were found uh, nested on top of the deposits. And this one, Pedring and Kiel, more recently, we had the uh, uh, twin typhoon. Uh, they called Pedring and Kiel. I think the international code name is uh, uh, Nalje and Nesat. This is Pampanga River. And it's about 50 to 100 meters wide. But after the onslaught of those twin typhoons, it expanded and swelled. Here it's about four kilometers, and here it was about 10 kilometers. So how can you do dredging for that kind of problem? It's, uh, it's simply impossible. Last year, we had Sendong that hit Cagayan de Oro, and that also hit um, uh, Iligan. This is Orchid's Homes subdivision. It's a low-cost to middle-cost type of housing. It was probably uh, 50 or 100 meters away. It's along the uh, floodplains. And when the floods came in, it left a pile of steel and rubble. There was a village just beside this, about 500 families that was totally devastated and it was gone. All that was left were stumps of concrete and there was no trace of the village at all. So just put it at three people per family, there's 500 families and that's about 1,500 people gone into the sea. And of course, we all know this um, uh, typhoon, Typhoon Pablo, which hit uh, the country uh, in the southern part. That was probably the strongest typhoon that hit the Philippines this year, and probably the strongest typhoon that hit Mindanao over the past two decades. And it was a Category 5 typhoon. And it's no small joke. It was packing winds of about uh, more than uh, 200 kilometers per hour. If it reaches 220 kilometers per hour, it would topple down uh, steel transmission towers. In, uh, during Dorian or Reming, uh, steel towers were toppled down about 146 of them. And in that area, uh, we had a lot of uh, problems and we're still trying to uh, recover from the impacts of the, of the onslaught of Typhoon Pablo. It is actually government's responsibility uh, our government is the mechanism to gather all together all good things for the benefit of society. And the president instructed uh, Secretary Montejo of the OST to make use of your taxpayers' money, 1.6 billion pesos of that, and put it into a good prog a program to address all of our disaster woes. And his instructions were the following. To do a flood mitigation uh, program specifically targeting a 6-hour flood early warning system to make enhanced geohazard maps and to make enhanced uh, storm surge vulnerability maps. The concept is very simple. We have sensors. We use advanced science and technology like satellites that would see the clouds and when they enter land, they would be detected. That would be used to inform people five days in advance. When it comes in, the Doppler radar would see it, measure the intensity and volume of rain. And then the sensors that we'll be deploying, about more than a thousand of them, would measure the rain gauges. And the water level sensors upstream would be able to measure the level of water to be able to warn the low-lying communities of impending floods or incoming floods at least six hours in advance. So that's a very simple concept. But to do all of that, you saw in that diagram, you have a topography. You cannot do the warnings and the flood simulations without good topographic maps. 
We have topographic maps for most of the Philippines of about 30 meter resolution, and it looks something like this. Is it clear? No. And we want it to go down to 2 meters, and even up to 25 centimeters. And that kind of simulation would be used to do the flood simulations for warning the people. In that diagram that I showed to you, it's already up. You can see it in the internet, but it's by no means the only way that we will show everything that we produce. We have the satellites showing Typhoon Pablo as it was coming in, the track where, it, uh, where it's going. And here, it was just about to hit landfall in Davao Oriental. Basically, why we're showing this is because we want to empower the LGUs. We want to empower the communities, the individuals. Because everybody has a right to defend themselves. Each family has a right to defend themselves or themselves. And even if you're poor, even if you're rich, you do have that right. That's the Doppler that I was talking about. This is Typhoon Pablo with its eye just about to hit Mindanao. And when it hit the mountains of Davao Oriental, it winked, nawala yung mata. No? And this one is another simulation of the uh, Doppler. No, it's actually not a simulation. It's the actual measurement as seen by the Doppler of a mesocyclone 70 kilometers wide. It's not as big as a typhoon. It's bigger though than a tornado. It's as big as Manila Bay. And it was a short-lived event. It just formed off the coast of Bataan and then in three hours hit Metro Manila as Typhoon Hiner in the north was passing above the Philippines. That is Habagat. You see the intensity and volume of rainfall as the rains or the clouds were coming in. And it's basically really to push information to the public, push information to the communities so that they'll have a good handle on the situation just in case communication lines break down during that crisis event. And if they do have that information, they may be able to use it for good decision-making processes. We're trying to install instruments, and these are all the instruments that have been installed so far. We have rain gauges, which are green. The blue, which are automated weather stations, gives us temperature, pressure, uh, wind direction, wind uh, speed, as well as humidity and temperature. And all of those, we try to put in in graphical form so that people can see at a glance what is happening. And during the event in, in, uh, in Mindanao, while Pablo was uh, passing through, we saw that the red was torrential, and that, that is torrential kind of rainfall. And that was used to look at the bridge upstream of Cagayan de Oro. This is upstream, that is downstream, and in about an hour, the water level rose by about seven meters. Seven meters, that's more than one story. And that was used to give the people in Cagayan de Oro lead time to know that a flood was going to happen. And the time that was given to them was about three to four hours. And in Cagayan de Oro, during the onslaught of Pablo, there were zero casualties because they knew that the floods were coming in. It's very, very important that we have knowledge and knowledge is power to save ourselves. We have simulations uh, during Marik uh, the, the Habagat floods, Marikina River swelled, and the simulations that uh, we conduct in Project NOAA is every 10 minutes to show to the people that the floods are coming in so that people can prepare and do something about it. And these simulations stream in the Project NOAA website. And apart from that, we have flood maps to show the emergency access routes, where to put search and rescue boats, where to develop, and so on and so forth. Without these maps, even if you know that floods are coming, but if you don't know where to go when the floods are coming, then the disaster effort and mitigation effort would fail. So it's important that these maps are available because these maps are useful for knowing what to do. Marikina residents and Cagayan de Oro residents knew what to do. They were knowledgeable, they were prepared, and they put it into action. But if it's 
just action, if it's just preparedness, without the government advice that is understandable, reliable, and timely, then the disaster mitigation effort again will fail. So it's important that those two aspects of disaster efforts be hand in hand. If one gets out, then it fails. In New Bataan, we had the problem. And the reason for that is because we didn't have detailed maps. We didn't have instruments at the top of the mountains. That's New Bataan, and we know that the most number of casualties that happened was in this place, and uh, the people in Compostela Valley actually went down because they were told to go get down and flee from the landslides. But when they went down, they didn't know that uh, that was a flood-prone area. And they got hit, and now they're all uh, in a very disastrous uh, situation. <clears throat> Apart from the information that we push, we're actually encouraging um, a culture of safety, a culture of preparedness. Without this culture, uh, everything would go wrong. This is what we're, we're trying to do. Uh, it's a simulation from the UK Met Office. This one is the simulated one that was the actual storm. And we actually used it for the Typhoon Pablo, giving us the amount of rain, the intensity of rain, so that we can bring together all that uh, are available for the benefit of the people. But somehow, things went wrong as well. But somehow, in Cagayan de Oro and in Iligan, things work well. We also want to do uh, this uh, launch of a satellite called PUSO, the Philippine University Science Observer, which brings satellite platforms onto the International Space Station. I think we should call this Philippine University's Science Observer for Disasters, or PUSO. <laughs> um, so we try to gather all of those that have been uh, collected before, that have been built before, because time in this world is too short. We can't do everything by ourselves. We need to collect, we need to build in order to put it into one whole program to ensure that we have a safe future. As I said, the world keeps on changing and nature selects. And perhaps only through science can we ensure our survival in this harsh world. Thank you very much.